Okay, um, so technical details. We want to try to go through uh, publicly verifiable backup. How do we do it? This one I like the most. Why? Because there's rarely something that we do that you can show non-cryptographers and they'll understand. And this is, they, they actually um, they get this. So uh, it's really easy for us, but it's also something we can show to other people, which is nice. Um, BIP32 uh, derivation, MPC friendly HD derivation, deterministic signing. I won't solve it, but I'll tell you why we may want to solve it. And it is a key compatibility, uh, what the problem is and how we can solve it. Okay, so public key verifiable backup. I'm given a private key X and a public key Q equals X times G. There's a public encryption key PK. I want to generate a cipher text C so that if I'm given C, Q, and PK, I'm able to verify that C indeed encrypts the discrete log of Q. Okay, the discrete log of Q is the private key, and I want to make sure that indeed you've encrypted the correct thing. Now, if I don't care what the encryption is and I can choose whatever encryption I want, and I can choose Payer, for example, then this becomes very easy, very efficient, very small ciphertext, and very simple. But that's not the way life works, and people want to use any encryption schemes because they want, again, use a UBHSM. From my understanding, they don't yet support Payer. Uh, there's also you know, classical le legacy HSMs and other things and standard libraries. So we want to be able to use RSA, ECIS, or any asymmetric scheme. And that, of course, makes it much harder because we don't have any algebraic structure that we can use in the encryption. You just encrypt something and you're dead. So how do you solve a problem in cryptography or zero knowledge when you don't have any algebraic structure? No. <laughs> Cut and choose. Cut and choose always works, right? So that's the basic idea. Okay, now, um, again, I just want to stress that when we're doing distributed key generation, like I talked about in the previous talk, so I have X1, the server has, uh, the service provider has X2, and the backup will be separate. So I'll back up X1, they'll back up X2, I'll have a public key Q1, they'll have a public key Q2, and the, the real public key is just Q1 plus Q2, but we can back up separately. There's no problem doing that at all. Okay, so, so there's no issue in terms of, I'm gonna be talking about this if I'm backing up the entire public key, but I can be backing up just a share of it as well and work exactly the same way. I hope that's clear. Okay. So here we go. I'm going to show you how to do an interactive proof with soundness one half to start with. So I have X, Q, and P, Q, P, K. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, choose random X0 and X1 so that X0 plus X1 equals X. And I'm going to uh, compute Q0 and Q1, which is public key, so to speak, so x0 times g and x1 times g. Note that q0 and q1 should obviously sum to q, the key that I'm, uh, the public key of what I'm backing up. And then I'm going to encrypt x0 and I'm going to encrypt x1 and I'm going to give all of this to the verifier. So I'll give them q0, c0, q1 and c1. And the verifier is going to go cut and choose. They're going to randomly ask me to open one of them and uh, so they can verify that I am behaving honestly. So they send me a random B, and then I'm just going to open the encryption. I'm going to open either the first encryption or the second encryption, and then the verifier is going to check the following thing. First, they're going to check that I indeed, the encryption that I originally sent is indeed correct. It is indeed to this uh, um, uh, X, uh, uh, what I opened up, X, B, and R, B, X, 0, X, R, 1, whatever, X, 0, R, 0. And then they're going to check, and this is the important check, that Q, B equals X, P times G. And now they're going to check that if I open 0, that this value here indeed matches what's inside. If I opened 1, they're going to check that this value here matches what's inside here. And then they're going to check... This should be Q0 plus Q1. They're going to check that Q equals Q0 plus Q1. And if yes, then they're going to accept. And why is this sound? The easiest way to, to calculate, to, to verify soundness, is just to check that if I can answer both queries, then indeed this, I have a valid uh, encryption that I can extract. So if I can answer both the 0 and 1 query, that means that Q0 equals x0 times g, which is what's in the encryption. 
and Q1 equals X1 times G, which is what's in the encryption. In the encryption. And the sum of those equals, the sum of those public keys equals the public key that I'm trying to back up the private key of. In other words, the two values inside the encryptions sum to the private key that I'm backing up. Yeah? Go like this or go like this or go like this. You can pull hair out if you still have hair. Most of you are young, you do. Good. Okay, so, um, so that's really, really simple in terms of zero knowledge. It's also very uh, obvious on the intui intuitive level. Uh, simply, uh, you're only opening one encryption to a random value that reveals nothing. On a more formal level, you can easily simulate by um, computing, you know, if you know B ahead of time, X, B, R, B, C, B, and Q, B, and then taking Q1 minus B to be Q minus Q, B. Because it's additive, you can easily, from the public key, generate the other Q value by yourself. Okay, so this is uh, very easy to do. Of course, soundness one half is probably good enough if you're um, uh, backing up two dollars worth. I'm always willing to lose a dollar, but not much more. Um, but also, we want public verifiability. We don't want interaction. So, uh, how do we make this not interactive? And the answer is very simple. Run in parallel 128 times and do Fiat Shamir. Okay. Is it really compact and nice and small and stuff? No. But can we live with it? Yes. Not a big deal. Okay. So, um, you could, yeah. Oh, uh, so this, uh, this is really important. There's a massive difference in the parameter you need when you're doing interactive and, and Fiat Shamir. When you do Fiat Shamir, you have to have a much longer because you can uh, uh, run yourself and try and break it. If you did 40, maybe you're saying 40 is enough, let's say 60. Maybe you say 60 is enough if it's interactive, but in two to the 60 time, you can, you, you can cheat. Exactly. All right, so um, I just want to stress that you can do optimizations, which are, of course, very important. One of them is to note that, let's say, you, let's say you're asked to do RSA. RSA cipher texts are very big, but you don't really need to choose a, a randomness which is massive. You can choose small randomness and use a seed and use a PRG in your RSA. So you're actually in the Fiat Shamir, you won't send the cipher, you won't include the cipher text. You'll, Include the ciphertext in the hash, but not in the proof. In the proof, you'll give the randomness and regenerate the ciphertext. It's like with Schnorr and many other things, or many of these zero-knowledge proofs. You can choose to put in the output, either the output of the hash or the input to the hash. So use the output of the hash. And uh, you can also do other optimizations where you don't split into two, you split into more, and you have a, like a tree-like structure, and you can trade off running time and, and bandwidth, but it's really not that important. So what's nice is you can do uh, a public verifiability very simply, and also in a way that people understand, which is always good. Because as cryptographers, we like to say, trust us, it works, don't worry. But actually, it's really nice when you can explain it to them. So, what about, let's move on to uh, BIP32 compliant wallets. Here's our beautiful diagram as well. And uh, the naive solution is to run fully malicious 2PC on the derivation circuit per key. Okay. Each derivation we said has three HMAC SHA-512 computations. Each HMAC is four SHA computations. That gives you about 687,000 gates. If you're doing a garbled circuit, that's about 21 megabytes. It's okay. Not thrilled. Your product manager looks at you a bit, eh, but we can live with it. Uh, but what about fully malicious protocols? So if I want to do garbled circuit cut and choose, I'm going to need maybe 40 to 60 circuits. Um, if I want to do authenticated garbling, maybe it's about 10x, but 20 megabytes, I can sell 200 megabytes. I'm not getting my bonus this year. So, um, see, it's, it's all a matter of incentives. So, um, so we want to improve this. We don't want to do fully secure, um, but also I strongly, strongly, or not strongly, I really, really don't believe in semi-honest security in these types of settings. Um, although I could probably live with semi-honest on the service provider and malicious on the uh, mobile, but I think it would be 
it would prevent me from testifying in court that there's no way the service provider could have learned the key. And that's what we want to be able to say. So, you know, you have a customer come and says, they stole my money, I didn't do the operation, and it's all gone. You want to be able to testify in court that there's no way you could have done it, and semi on a security won't give that to you. Uh, so, okay, this could be too expensive. So first thing I want to say that it's really important to look at the small things first. As cryptographers, the most, when you look at this problem, the big thing you say is, okay, what are we going to do instead of the, um, uh, uh, instead of the, the fully malicious protocol, and, and how can we maybe optimize really hard things? But sometimes there are really, really simple things that you can optimize, and it's good to start with them. So in BIP32, the HMAC key, which is a real surprise, was a surprise for me, by the way, because I would have said that the HMAC key should be the secret value and the input should be the public value, but it's the other way around. The HMAC key is actually what's called the chain code, which is not, maybe it's semi-private or not private, and the input is the secret value, okay? And if you can provide the chain code to both MPC parties, then you can reduce the HMAC computation from four SHA operations to only two SHA operations. And, um, and then you can save half of, your, uh, half of your computation. Let's have a look why. A this is HMAC. Um, so the reason why it's four operations is because the path fits into one block. So you have a first operation up here where it's KX or iPad and the IV, and here it's iPad here, OPAD, and then, uh, then you have, uh, an then you're running on this on the input, and then this is coming out here. So the question is, what's the secret which is shared? If K is shared and secret, then you need to do all four of these in, um, in the MPC. But if this is public, and this is public, then I can locally compute this, and locally compute this, and these values just define the next circuit. And the circuit only needs to compute these two. Very simple. We've now saved half the cost. By design. By design. <laughs> Thank you. I hope everybody, maybe do the, do, do, do the young ones know? This is the designer of HMAC here in the room, so you should know. H is for who? H is for who? <laughs> yeah. And M is from here. Um, <laughs> interesting, I never thought of that. Okay, um, one thing to note, though, is that um, if you're doing um, this circuit together, and we have to do three derivations, right? Remember if the, in the BIP diagram? So we're doing three derivations, right? One, two, three. Then you just throw all these uh, uh, HMAX into one big circuit, and you just do it in one shot. If you're going to do this, then it means that you're going to be revealing the chain code at each step to the MPC parties. If you reveal the chain code at each step, that means that you need to run this now in three different MPC operations. Okay? Not a big deal, except that first it gives you a trade-off of rounds versus bandwidth, which depending on your situation um, can be significant. But it means that you now have to have states between these executions. Because what's coming out of one operation is secret output that has to go into the next operation. And again, how do you ensure that the parties don't change that? If I just output you shares of this intermediate value, you need somehow to prevent the parties from changing those in the next, value, in the next one. In garbled circuits, it's easy to solve, but it's just something you need to note needs to be done. Okay, uh, a second one which is really obvious is that you can keep the intermediate values in the tree. So if you need to de derive five different keys, it's not five times three, because this you only ever need to do once. And this, you, you only, if you're deriving two keys here, you can do, for these two keys here, you can do one, two, three, four, not six. And if it's for these four keys, it becomes seven and not 12. So that's an obvious uh, optimization, but these things can be uh, 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 are very important to look at. Okay, the next thing is what about the fully secure MPC? So I want to uh, uh, propose using a protocol that uh, is uh, generally not liked and respected in our field called dual execution. 
So what is dual execution? Let's go back to basic uh, uh, two PC using Yao semi-honest. Okay, how does it work? The gobbler and evaluator will run oblivious transfer. And then the gobbler will take a garbled circuit and send it to the evaluator. And the evaluator will evaluate and we're finished. This protocol, if I take maliciously secure oblivious transfer, and oblivious transfer is really cheap today, if I take maliciously secure oblivious transfer, turns out to be secure against a malicious evaluator because they're getting oblivious transfer outputs and they're getting a garbled circuit and the only thing they can do with the garbled circuit is evaluate it. They can't do anything else. <laughs> the problem is that it's completely broken for a malicious gobbler because the malicious gobbler can just gobble any garbage they want and it can compute any function, and as long as it has the same structure, you won't know. So in particular, it could output, their output could be something that reveals all of the secrets. So this is the problem with using um, standard, you know, sort of one direction uh, uh, Yao uh, based uh, um, uh, garbled circuits. And um, the dual execution method says the following idea. If that's the property, let's run this in both directions. And I'll send a garbled circuit to you, and you'll send a garbled circuit to me. And then at the end, before we reveal the output, because remember, if I reveal the output, it's all over. Because Dan sent me a garbled circuit, and this time in this talk, he's the corrupted one. So he sent me the garbled circuit, which is completely broken. Complete, like a, it, 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 it computes a function that reveals my, all of my secrets. As long as I haven't revealed it yet to Dan, he hasn't learned anything. So what I do is now I do another computation in the opposite direction to Dan, and then we compare in some secure manner, or in some manner we compare the output, and if it's the same, then we reveal. And why, why is that good? Because if it's the same, then I know that I gave Dan a correct garbled circuit. So I know that the result is fine. Okay, this is cool, except that it's not that easy because dual execution is leaky. Because then, knowing a bit of cryptography, doesn't send me a garbled circuit that computes the derivation. What it does is sends me a garbled circuit that says, if the first bit of Yehuda's secret is zero, then compute the correct garbled circuit. Otherwise, compute garbage. And there are people saying, wow, can you, can you do that in a way that's undistinguished? Yes, it's extremely easy. You just set the wire in the first gate to always be zero output. And then he does it again in the second, and in the third, and in the fourth. And, in, and what happens is that in the first time we run this, um, he, learns, he learns a bit. Either I catch him cheating, but then I won't play with him again. Or I don't catch him cheating, but he learned a bit. But I'm not so worried if, he doesn't, if I don't catch him cheating, he, learned, he guessed the bit with probability one half. And then he could guess two bits with a probability of one quarter. He can pretty much do that without me. The problem is what happens in the cases where I catch him, or do I actually catch him? And that's where it gets tricky. So I'll get to. I'll come in a second. So firstly, in general, this uh, uh, um, this method is not. We, we don't like to think about using it in general for our MPC tasks because it could reveal the most important bit. We're doing something. We want to compare DNA. And I just want to know one very specific predicate. It's not a bit, it's a predicate. I just want to know, does this person I'm comparing DNA with have a genetic disposition to some specific disease? And I can learn that one bit. So in, for general MPC tasks, this is not a good idea. And therefore, this is something that we generally don't like to do. But what about for key derivation? For key derivation, I know that the input is random. And I know that revealing a single bit or predicate about the input doesn't matter. I understand that it's not important. But it doesn't mean I can use it easily. Firstly, we have to make sure you can't run in parallel. Because if you can run in parallel, what you can do is run 256 in parallel. In each one, have a different guess, learn all of the bits of the secret, run and steal all of my money before I can... I discovered that Dan cheated, but it's too late because he already stole all of my money. Um, the second and more difficult problem is that Dan's smart guy. So what happens is we're doing an equality check, and although we'd like the world to be fair, the world is not fair. 
And in particular, we don't know how to do fair two-party computation. So one of us gets the output of the equality check first. So depending how it's set up, but Dan gets the output first. And Dan now has to send me a message so I get output. Now, if he was dumb, he would send me the output. He'd say, ah, I caught you cheating. But he's not dumb. He says, ah, oh, my phone crashed. Sorry, can we do it again? Now, I might be suspicious, but I have 100 million users or 500 million users, and phones really do crash. And things happen, and, and I'm not going to, you know, if I'm going to send police to every customer who, uh, uh, whose phone crashed accidentally during an, uh, an operation, my bonus is certainly gone. So, um, so we wanted, the aim is we wanted to be able to ensure, ensure recovery from accident aborts, or in general, we want to be able to distinguish the case that Dan's phone really just crashed because it's an accidental abort, so the case that he's trying to cheat. And how can, we, how can we distinguish an abort from an abort? Well, here's the real world, and we can use additional things. Before we do this equality check at the end, we can encrypt, we ask Dan to encrypt whatever he needs to be able to recover and continue that again. And he can encrypt that and give it to me, I'm the service provider, and I'll put it aside. But what key do we encrypt it under? Because Dan will say, not that his phone, phone uh, crashed and opened up, he's going to say he lost his phone. So what do we encrypt it with? Now's the time we test if anybody listens in the previous session. Hmm? It's written there even? Ah, it's even there, okay. I didn't have enough uh, bullet, uh, no, no, not enough animations. Do you remember that we put an encryption key in the backup so that we could back? So we have an encryption key, let's use it. So if, it, and if that's gone, then he's lost all his money anyway, right? So it doesn't really matter. So we already have an encryption key and we can use that. And in case there's, there's an accident to the board, the first thing that we do next time we want to do an operation is we check a flag, the server, service provider lit, lit a flag saying, this didn't finish well. You have, to, it's, you have to be really careful about the order of operations, it's not that easy. But, but you, can, you can do this in a way that you set the flag, send the message, and if you get the answer back, then you unset the flag. And this way you're able to fully distinguish between accidental abort and a non-accidental and, and a malicious abort. And in this case, dual execution uh, uh, gives you everything you want for this application. And that means that all you have to do is upload one circuit and download one circuit. Okay, that's all you need. And that's about, uh, you know, 20 megabytes or so for, for the operation. It's not a lot, but it's not, it's not a little bit, but it's not too much. Even there, by the way, you could argue that you may want to do something with more download and less upload, and you can do things like that as well, but I won't discuss that now. Okay, any questions on that? And make sure no parallelization. Questions? Can you make sure there are no parallelizations? In a, in, in a wallet, for sure. If you have hundreds of millions of users and you, the server is distributed. You have a, so if, if the server, server is a service, then you can lock in the database. It's not a problem. That's not a problem. Okay. Uh, now let's talk about the other elements I talked about before. And there's output. Yes. Is the building institution faster than all that? In fa faster in terms of what? But it's a dual execution. Or why, why two HMAC versus? It's always the same. The the, yeah, the, same yeah. the, the authenticated gobbling. I think the estimates are that's about, about 10x, okay. and this is this is two. So or it's two in separate directions. Yes, it's much more efficient. It's also much simpler. And there are big advantages in simplicity. Okay, so uh, we run dual execution and we get the, uh, the derived key shares x1 and x2. And now we're going to run distributed key generation. Um, and uh, again, what's the problem? We don't know that you're going to input the correct x1, x2. And now maybe that means that your backup is not valid. So here's another native solution I talked about beforehand. Have the, com have the garbled circuit compute. The key that is not viable. All right, so here's a simple solution. Uh, again, solutions are not, uh, 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 I don't think the solutions are difficult. I think that the important thing is having awareness to all of these problems. So the parties will also input random A1, B1, A2, B2, 
And the circuit will compute the derived key, and then will compute a one-time Mac, essentially, of A times X plus B. And um, we prefer this to be over the integers, so we just make things to be the right sizes of stuff, so A can be 64 bits, and B will be uh, 64 bits bigger than A times X, so that it drowns out any information about X, so it'll be 384 bits. And then after the execution, what we'll do is the first party will send a commitment, not the value, a commitment to Q1, which is X1 times G, their share of the, uh, the output key, B1, capital B1, which is little b1 times G, and little a1. Okay, you'll see why in a second. Party P2 will send the same thing back, but without a commitment. And then party 1 will decommit. And the test that they'll run is that T times G is A1 plus A2 times the public keys that they sent, plus B1 plus B2. So just taking this one time Mac and raising it into the elliptic curve, and then you'll just verify that all of these things match. Okay, and you can do that because you know the little A1, A2, and you know everything else. Okay? So why, what, what's the, uh, and if there's an output Q, and then I know that's the correct public key. So what's the intuition as to why this is correct? So first, this is the equation above. So, so the first thing to note is that because the first party commits and the second party sends, you have to send your values, T is known, you have to send your Q1, A1, and B1 before you see the other one's value and, and, and vice versa. Now, if party P1 wants to change Q1 to Q1 prime, so they want to add some delta, they want to make it different, they need to find A1 prime and B1 prime so that the following equation holds. And they need to do this, of course, without knowing A2 and B2. So you can just easily play around with this and add some math to your equations to make it look like you're smart, and you end up getting something that becomes very hard because A is not known, it's, it's uh, you know, on an intuitive level, it's very, it's very obvious. It's a one-time Mac where you don't see the output and you have statistical security. Okay, so it's hard to find these values if you don't know, uh, um, if, you don't, if you don't know ahead of time. And the important thing here is to know is that you're multiplying A by delta X and delta X is non-zero because you're changing the X value. If you're not changing the X value, then who cares? I only care if you change the X value. Okay? So, how much does this cost? AND gates, any guess? 64-bit A, 384-bit B. Come on, just... No one has any Boolean circuit intuition? It's about 20,000 gates, which isn't great. But this is where we say thank you to Hugo, because HMAC is so many, who cares about 20,000 more? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I would like to reduce that as well, but, but this is, it's certainly okay, it's certainly fine, it's not a massive deal. And, and privacy-wise, it's fine because B is big enough to hide A given T. No, we actually give T the output, so T is A times X plus B, we're not doing modular reduction in order to make the circuit smaller, but that means that we need to um, make B longer. But making B longer, we don't really care about. It's a, it's a few more oblivious transfers. They're very cheap. And it's addition. Addition is not expensive. It's the multiplication which is expensive. And this is much, much better than doing a 256-bit modular multiplication. That would be horrible. Here, you're only multiplying by 64 bits. OK? OK. So this is how we do output enforcement. You could say, and Iftach always uh, tells me off for being too specific in the application, this is actually a very general, generic solution for bridging between a, a Boolean circuit computation that you want to bind to an elliptic curve secret and public key. You can use this effect always if you want to bind those things together. Okay, so I have some private, private elliptic curve or private scalar inside an, a, a Boolean circuit, computation, MPC, it doesn't matter if it's dual execution, this is completely black box. And I want to be able to reflect outside and ensure that we know the correct public key to what was done inside that Boolean circuit. This method will enable you to do that in, gen in general. Okay? All right. What about input enforcement? Okay, so again, we, had, we started with this seed. We're deriving from the seed. 
how do we enforce the parties to always use the same thing? So first, the thing we do is we generate this seed and we back it up. What does that mean we generate back up? I choose M1. The service provider chooses M2. We use publicly verifiable backup. When we're using publicly verified backup, it means that we have some Q1 and Q2 as well, which, relate to the, which relates to that seed or, or that, maybe not seed, I should say, it's the root master key of the BIP tree. It's, the, it's actually the root master key and not the seed. And um, so we can run a secure computation with the input seed shares, and we can use this exact same method. Right? Because again, this, all this method, method does is make sure that we bind a secret value inside the Boolean circuit to some public value. I can do it on the output, or I can do the same thing on the input. So we can use the same method actually to do input enforcement. Or we can also do something else, is we can uh, uh, generate this, we can do this the first time we do a computation, we can indeed use the method from the previous slide, but from then on, but in that computation, we can generate a one-time MAC that we can repeatedly use, and a very, very good one-time MAC for that is GHash. If you know ASGCM, in ASGCM, there's something called GMAC, which is the authenticator part. GMAC uses a, uh, um, a, uh, a one-time or a type of universal hash function called GHash. Any idea how many AND gates in a GHash circuit? Come and throw out a number. Just quickly. One multiplication word. No, no, Boolean, Boolean. Sure, it's a Boolean circuit. 20,000. Hmm? 40,000. 40, then I would, yeah, I would prefer to use the previous solution then. Samuel? 800, right? Something very small. About 800. Because it's a binary, it's a binary field, it's really, really efficient. <laughs> Yeah, you need to do some additional stuff that Samuel spent a long time doing. But. Okay. Um, what about... Okay, so that's what I have to say about BIP compliant wallets for now. Any questions on that before I go on? Ask now or forever hold your peace. Or at least at the end of the session. Okay, so MPC-friendly uh, derivation. Here we want to use something that is... I mean... We, we, we got a very impressive result in the previous, what we've talked about now, right? This is much, much more efficient than naive. Much, much more efficient, but bottom line, it's still expensive. So we'd like to do much, much better. So, um, so basically we want to do something which is with nice algebraic structure. And I want to stress that if you're not worried about input and output enforcement, this is not a hard problem to solve. In particular, you can be really naive and simply uh, have each party even hold a PRF that they use for derivations, right? Each party holds a PRF, and then they derive from that PRF, they back up those PRF keys locally, or, or you know, whatever using the backup. But if you're not worried about input and output enforcement, th this is a very, you know, it's not a difficult problem, and you can do it in multiple different ways, but you don't really have to worry about much. One thing I do want to warn against is, or at least in my humble opinion, is these uh, circuit, you know, taking a circuit efficient hash and improving on BIP32 derivation by taking uh, a hash function that is much fewer uh, AND gates, but also in terms of its security, is it going to be enough? I don't know. Uh, the flip side of that and why maybe it's, you know, I could be very wrong is, what property do we want from this hash function? We don't need collision resistance. We want pseudo-randomness, and that's much easier than collision resistance. So, you know, maybe actually, you know, it's enough. One thing actually which could make a lot of sense is to use, to use AES. We thought about doing that once, but we decided that if it's going to be not compatible, let's make it really efficient. But if you just change it to AES, it's already going to be a tenth, I think a tenth of the size. Yeah. Isn't HMAC an instantiation of PRF, so think of it as a <coughs> But it's an expensive PRF. Yes, yes, I'm saying that. Yeah, so using... Collision resistance, non-collision resistance. Yeah, yeah, so I'm saying if you wanted to, that's what I'm saying, I wouldn't go the route of a hash, but if you wanted to go, for example, with AES, that, that's it just... But then you're sort of, you're not compatible, but you're still doing Boolean circuit MPC. If you're going to be compatible, let's go all the way to something algebraic. But if, again, indeed, if you go to AES, it's going to be not, not a tenth, 
much less, because you're going to do one AES for each, yeah, it can be like a 40th. AES actually would be very cheap. We should say yes. Yeah. Um, very patient. AES doesn't lend itself so easily to hashing. Not hashing. You have a secret. I'm using this as a, I'm, I'm taking the root of my tree is a secret key. And I, it's a PR, and I use the secret key to derive an, an, an output. This is a classic PRF application. It's one AES operation where the secret is not the input, the secret is the key. Why Well, because an AES is like 5,400 AND gates. We said that uh, uh, we were doing, for standard derivation, we're doing 12, we're doing three HMACs, that's like 12, uh, uh, 12 uh, a SHA 512. So it's 148th, even less than 148th. Because it's not being compatible, I'm not going to be compatible. I don't need to, I mean, I could say I want to derive three steps, but I don't see any real need in those intermediate steps anyway. And if I wanted the intermediate steps, so it'll be, a, so it'll be a three AESs instead of three HMAC SHA 512s, it'll be a tenth. Okay? All right, so I want to give you an imperfect yet reasonable solution. It's imperfect, you'll see why in a moment. And the tool I want to use is a VRF. Uh, and by the way, we're working to a full better solution, but uh, we don't have it done yet. So uh, what's a VRF? A VRF, I think you all know, but it's basically a committed PRF. Uh, so here's the VRF I want to show, the very, very, very uh, clean and simple one. We provide some uh, public key capital K for a secret key little k. We have a random oracle to a curve. This is, I think, Dan and Benny. And who's this? A few people in this room. And uh, the PRF is we hash the message or the input to a curve and we multiply it by K. And the reason why this looks random is this classic DDH. Because you have K, you have capital K, which is a random element, and uh, you... Uh, sorry, no, that's not it. It's little K times H of M. I'm an idiot. It's little K times H of M. You can't multiply two elliptic curves points together, at least, yeah. So it's, it's little k, sorry, over here, times h of m. And because little k times h of m, and h of m is a random point by the random oracle, this looks, this looks random, okay? And this also just is very MPC friendly, by the way, because uh, you can have each one party holding k1, the other k2, and you can separately multiply. But after, even you don't even have to have it in MPC, because each side can hold their own VRF. So, but this is, this is the VRF you want to use. And how do I prove that I gave you the correct value? It's very easy. I just proved to you this is a diffie hellman tuple. And therefore, it's, this is like the simplest VRF in the world, I think. Okay, so how can I do imperfect MPC-friendly derivation? I'm going to hold shares of a root key, K1, K2. Um, Oh, here I'm really confusing you with uh, notation. That's not the same K1 as the previous slide. This is like the, uh, the elliptic curve key in the, in the uh, root of the BIP tree, or the, the HD tree. And I have a different VRF. And we're going to use that VRF to simply derive uh, um, values delta 1, delta 2. So each party will derive a different value and send it to the other with a proof that it's correct. And we're going to set the new public key to be the root plus delta times g. Okay? And the private shares, one party will make theirs k1 plus delta, and the others will just stay k2. And then you can run whatever uh, party protocol that you're using beforehand. And if you think about it, this is like normal derivation, to someone who mentioned that in the previous session, except that only the MPC parties compute can compute that derivation. And here it's an interesting philosophical discussion that's worth having, and that's also what makes this imperfect. It's we have, like very often, we have the philosophy that if one of the MPC, if one of the parties participating is completely corrupt and malicious, then we don't lose anything. I'm not sure we always need to go all that way. Maybe we can say that if one of the parties is corrupted, the most important properties that we need remain, we may lose something which is less important. Okay? And, um, and in this case, 
I, I would argue that, so what happens if a party is corrupted? So if a party is corrupted, now, what do we even lose here? I guess we lose, we lose linkability, unlinkability, but the MPC parties anyway know all the public keys, so it's linkable. Um, I'm not really sure what are we losing here. The other thing we're losing here is that you have to rely on the, no, the security of the normal derivation. So the normal derivation, by the way, in, 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 in BIP, in BIP32, there, are some, there, there is some work which proves some things, but you're actually computing signatures on related keys. So the, the relation between those keys, you actually will know as the MPC parties in this case. The, one of the advantages of Bitcoin is that there is so much money out there that is being used with these systems that after a few years and nobody has managed to steal anything, you could argue that this makes it a reasonable assumption. But again, I would call this an imperfect solution because of that reason. Normal derivation is used all the time in Bitcoin, and yet nothing bad has happened. There are some proofs, almost, on, on what is being done, but that's what makes it imperfect. Uh, this is, uh, uh, um, I think it's a reasonable solution, but it's not the uh, optimal solution in my opinion. Questions? Yeah. Does this trick work with threshold? Everything works with threshold. So my, my, my approach to threshold is as follows. Um, once you have Lagrange, a polynomial, to additive sharing is just, is just a local operation. And from additive sharing to a polynomial, it's also easy. So the, I, I've very, rarely, very rarely do you find a situation, I haven't found any at least in everything that I've been doing, that it makes a difference. Well, if you use a regular hash function, it will make a difference, right? Even if you apply the Lagrange and the sums of... What do you mean a regular hash function? Like instead of... Like it, this only works if the PRF is, like the output of the PRF is additive, right? In a the, the, I'm talking about this PRF. Yes. You asked me about this solution. The PRF, this VRF. This VRF is just little k times h of m. Ignore what's actually written here. It's little k times h of m. So if these k, this k is shared, not just in a polynomial, in an access structure using threshold gates and uh, uh, um, addition, uh, and gates, or gates, you can, you can always easily just uh, share K in that way and then reconstruct. Because it's additive. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Does, sorry. Does quantum computation somehow affect the solution you are presenting here? I'm, I'm going to give you my really honest opinion. I couldn't care less. Um, the, the, the entire blockchain is... The whole blockchain... Not everybody in Coinbase agrees with me, you're right. Um, the entire blockchain is not post-quantum secure. Um, if, you, if you tell me, listen, I'm, I'm storing secret data that needs to be secret in 25 years, I don't think I'll see uh, quantum computers before I die, but I'm not that arrogant to say you shouldn't worry about that. But signatures makes no sense whatsoever. Signatures, if they start being quantum computers which can uh, uh, get even close to anything that... You know, we spent the last 30 years where every year people are telling us that in 10 years' time it's there. Okay, so let's say we get to a stage where we start getting worried, then we just move everything across to... to it's not something where... It, I'm not worried. I'm just not... It's not a concern that I have. So, and I know that's not necessarily a popular opinion, but I think it's popular to say, here's an unpopular opinion, right? <laughs> okay. Um... If you're asking, is this type of technique amenable to post -quantum? Yes, of course, because additively uh, uh, homomorphic type constructions like this, you always have with lattices. So these types of things can, of course, be done. But it's not something I'm worried about now. By the way, just as a true story, we had a customer once in Unbound who didn't buy our solution because they wanted to protect their passwords, their users' passwords, with post-quantum secure encryption. It's nuts. Absolutely nuts. Someone in the company said, cryptography from now on has to be post-quantum secure, and that was the one thing they wanted to use, that the thing, and therefore they, they, they... 
And we have to, you know, think about what we're applying it to and if it makes any sense. Okay, what about deterministic signing? Why do we care? I know some people in the world care. Uh, some people care because they say, well, randomness is bad. We can't rely on randomness. I, personally, I'm a bit less concerned in the MPC setting, but, but again, okay, if you're worried about the, the, the nonce generation, I accept. Um, but here's an interesting one, which I, I was really surprised when I heard about this. Maybe many of you are familiar with this, but I wasn't. And I think it's, it's just very interesting. So let's say you have a DAP. And this DAP wants to do a snark or something and needs a key for that. But the user has a standard wallet. They have a Ledger wallet or a MetaMask or even a Coinbase wallet. And, um, and they own that wallet only supports ECDSA and EDDSA. What do you do? Good question, right? How do you build your DAP so you can work with a standard Ledger wallet? Do you know what people do? Does anybody know? Who knows what they do? Put up your hand. We have one. Okay, what they do is the following thing. Upon enrollment to use this DAP with this wallet, they ask you to sign twice on the same message. And if you sign twice on the same message, they said, aha, you have deterministic signing. Cool. Since you have deterministic signing, I'm going to say that this wallet is supported, and otherwise I'm going to tell you no. And if it is supported, then I'm going to ask you to sign on a fixed message and use the result as the key. Okay, there you go. And the interesting fact, which by the way is a great exercise in a uh, undergrad uh, cryptography course, is that the hash of a signature is actually a PRF. There you go. It's even a VRF if it's unique, uh, but that's when we give it without the hash though. That's pre-hash. The proof is the, ah, the proof is the signature. Ah, oh, cool, I didn't know that. Thank you. Uh, to one second. And, uh, and the reason, just intuitively for anyone who doesn't see it, is because the signature has to be high entropy, because if it's not high entropy, then you can break the signature scheme. Okay, yes, question. Uh, isn't it to sign a That's horrible. It's a horrible solution. It makes every cryptographer just squirm in your seats. Uh, I say something else. What happens if you're a really conscientious person and you're using an MPC wallet? You don't want to use a, you don't want a local key anywhere. Good question, right? So if you're a good uh, service provider, then you'll make sure that if this is done, that the signature ends up at the user side, at the customer, at the consumer wallet side, and not on the service provider side, because then self-custody goes out the window. But still, you, you, this is not giving you at all what you're expecting. And nobody tells you. It's under the hood. It's even worse. It's horrible. <laughs> wallets, a lot of wallets, like, log the signatures. So now you write into log... Too much information. We really don't want to know. We really just don't want to know. Uh, this is part of the problem. I think that, the, the, you know, the, it's, it's a real problem. There's a lot of stuff that's going on that is... Uh, anyway, doesn't matter. We'll, we'll get there. Slowly, slowly. But in any case, what's interesting here is that if beforehand you didn't care about deterministic signing, now you have to care about deterministic signing because your product manager is going to tell you you have to support this. You can see I love product managers, right? I do if anybody's looking out there. Okay, so um, I, actually I do because they know what people actually want. So uh, what's the naive solution? I'm not going to tell you how to solve this. I'm going to tell you how not to solve this. Okay? The naive solution is each party will use a local pseudorandom function to derive randomness from the message. And that's what they'll use, the randomness that they'll use inside the, the MPC protocol for generating the nonce. Okay, so all these, all, every protocol that I know for ECDSA or EDDSA or EDDSA just schnorr, right, over, over Edward's curve with, with certain derivations. So everyone just uses, you generate the nonce in the signature with uh, a randomness that each party are locally chose. So instead of locally choosing randomness, what you do is you will um, uh, generate it with a PRF that in, on, on, apply to the message and that ensures that if you, and probably you should do the public key as well just to be really sure, whatever, but that will ensure that if you sign twice on the same message, you are going to use the same randomness. Cool. Here's an attack. So the attacker just uses different randomness in the two signatures. I mean, 
nothing for nothing there's nothing enforcing forcing to actually use the output of that prf let's have a look what happens at schnorr so this is schnorr signatures you the nonce is little r uh, you compute a big r which is r times g and s is r plus the hash of the message and the r and the public key this is horribly in insecure here I'm surprised nobody yelled at me yet, uh, uh, times k. And r is r1 plus r2 chosen by the parties, and the attacker will set r i prime seems to be r i plus delta. Okay, of course they know delta. And what you can see is that if you're given the signature s and s prime, and you know, uh, um, and, and, and here you have this is r plus this, and this is r plus delta plus this, and you know the delta. Then if you subtract S from S prime, the R's fall away. You can subtract delta because you know delta. And then you simply get the same uh, key extraction as if you knew the nonce completely. So in fact, getting two signatures where you know the difference between the nonces is the same as getting uh, a signature where you actually know the nonce value and you could able to extract the secret key. So I'm not giving you a solution to deterministic signing, I'm giving you a non-solution. Don't do that. Okay, what about EDDSA? I want to finish on, this is another interesting, uh, uh, a very interesting thing. What is EDD, what EDDSA is a schnorr um, uh, on the Edwards curve, probably called EDDSA because it makes people more comfortable to moving it from ECDSA. And uh, your uh, SHA-512, the way it works is as follows. It but it has additional derivations. So the first derivation you have is for the key, you take a key k, you SHA-512 hash it, and you get two parts. The first part you, is what you'll actually use for the signing key, x, and the second part, you'll use it for a derivation key, we'll call it d, that's what you use to derive the randomness. When you sign a message, you generate the nonce by applying SHA-512 to the derivation key and the message, and then you'll generate a Schnorr signature. Okay, good, excellent. So EDSA is Schnorr with key and random derivation. Schnorr is very MPC friendly and EDSA is extremely non-MPC friendly. And in fact, in general, most uh, MPC implementations of EDDSA are not really EDDSA, the Schnorr over the Edwards curve. They're indistinguishable uh, up to uh, the fact that they're very often even probabilistic. Okay, so if we don't care about deterministic signatures, then we can just do schnorr and say, I don't care. And again, as long as I'm not signing twice in the same message, so I'm not uh, you know, supporting those dApps, then I'm absolutely fine with working in this way. Um, I would argue that in many, or maybe even most cases, this is good enough, but what about compatibility? And you would seem, I think, to everybody here in this room, and, and, and to me until not too long ago, that there's actually no problem because it's a schnorr, it's schnorr, it's just a schnorr key. So if I've generated a key for schnorr in MPC, then uh, I can export that key to be used some, somewhere else using, with EDDSA. And, uh, um, and it should work for all EDDSA implementations, and yeah, so I don't have the derivation key, I can just give a random D, I don't really care. And you, you can't regenerate the same signatures, but who cares really about that anyway. So this looks fine, except that it's not fine. Because all wallets, and I mean all wallets, expect to receive the pre-derivation key, key K, and not because they're idiots, because that's what the standard actually says. The key is the pre-derivation key, and that's what they use. They don't use the, uh, uh, the, the X that comes afterwards. So if I want to generate an X in MPC, for an MPC-based uh, uh, EDDSA, and I wanted to be able to export so that it can be used by any other code. I'm not talking about something which is full BIP39 compliant. Just enable someone to input this into an OpenSSL implementation of EDDSA, I can't. I can't. I could provide my own proprietary code and tell the customer, you know what? If you want to, if you want to sign here, you can sign using this proprietary code. They don't really like that. So the solution is a bit painful, but it's only one SHA-512. We're saved from the HMAC part here at least. 
Um, and everything that we talked about beforehand with BIP derivation and, and, and enforcement, so using the, uh, um, the dual execution and all that sort of stuff, that's what we're going to do upon key generation. So we'll start with a K in order to get the X, and then we'll just run Schnorr from then on. It means key generation becomes more expensive, not intolerable. It's 58,000 gates, not the end of the world, but it's certainly like completely killing a really MPC-friendly, great signing scheme that is wonderful and just, again, making it uh, uh, very, very painful. Questions? Okay, so in summary, yeah. On on key generation, yeah, yeah. Signing is fine, yeah, on on key generation. Which, which arguably is fine, but, but again, it very much depends. There are, uh, um, very often you actually, if you're generating a wallet or something, you're in some environment, you want to generate a wallet, they're going to expect a public key straight away, for example, so that uh, um, to, to continue doing whatever you want to do. So you actually have to take the time to do the operation at that time. It depends on the application. You can care more or care less, but it's, it's, it's not terrible, but it's painful. It's probably sub-second from a mobile or something, but again, you're very much dependent on upload. You still need to upload this garbled circuit, and, and if you're in a, a mobile phone in a third world country, then this arguably is, 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 can be a problem. It's worth thinking about better solutions. Okay, so uh, in summary, I think... Uh, we can, I hope I've convinced you that MPC wallets are a great fit for what we want to do, uh, but naive solutions can be very dangerous. There's a lot, a lot of things around the signing and key generation which are obvious to get something which is truly robust and gives us everything that we need. Um, and I think that along the, uh, along the road, there are a lot of things that we've talked about and done that, that you can see significant improvements um, can be can be uh, have have major implications, and I think there's a lot a lot of more really good research uh, uh, questions here that uh, would be great. Uh, it'd be great if the community solves. Thank you. <laughs>